what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. U.S. health advisors want you to know your health coverage does not have to be complicated. If you aren't happy with your insurance plan, there are unlimited and comprehensive medical plan options available to you right now. U.S. health advisors offer solutions which can't be found anywhere else. They can even offer you the ability to purchase more coverage if and when you need it. U.S. Health Advisors offers fair rates and no surprises. Sounds nice, doesn't it? If you'd like to know more, contact U.S. Health Advisors at 828-554-3032 or by email at daniel.bryant at ushadvisors.com. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on the Mesh.tv. My name is Alan Jackson. I am co founder and co director of the Foot Candle Film Society and the annual Foot Candle Film Festival. Chris Fry with me as always. The other co of that co title, co director, co founder as well. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Looking forward to talking about some uh, big films. Yeah. So, so for Kindle Films, as you probably have inferred from the title and from the fact that you queued up the podcast, probably understand that we are going to be talking about movies in this podcast. Every time we get together, we have at least one, maybe a few more reviews of movies that are either new in theaters or available online as new new releases. We uh, typically cram in some other things in the show, but Chris, I tell you what, we've got so much going on on this episode. We're just going to dig right into some movie reviews, if that's okay with you. Sounds like a good idea. Uh, It's the end of the year. All the kind of uh, award season is gearing up for the Oscars. Films are trying to make sure they get shown before that December 31st cutoff. We're getting inundated with screeners ourselves. We are. So let's go ahead and knock out a few while we're sitting here together for this episode. We're going to review three films in this episode today. First up, we'll be reviewing the latest film from director James Mangold, starring Matt Damon and Christian Bale. That is Ford versus Ferrari. We will follow that up with Brian Johnson's latest film, The Who Done It Knives Out. And then our third and final review of the show will be the uh, Mary Ellen Heller's film, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, about Mr. Rogers, and based on a true story from his past. So, Chris, three great films to talk about, or at least have some comments to talk about, I'm sure. Let's go ahead and get into our first review, if we can, which is Ford versus Ferrari. And that's it, folks. Ferrari wins the 24 Hours of Le Mans for the fifth consecutive year. Mr. Ford, Ferrari has a message for you, sir. What did he say? You said Ford makes ugly little cars in an ugly factory. And, uh, he called you fat, sir. We're gonna bury Ferrari at Le Mans. So the great Carroll Shelby is gonna build a car to beat Ferrari with a Ford. Correct. And how long did you tell them you needed? Two or three hundred years? Ninety days. (laughs) James Mangold, director of genre films Logan and 310 to Yuma, is no stranger to the notion of the Oscar Beatty biopic. He gave us Walk the Line in 2005, and now he gives us Ford vs. Ferrari, which tells the story of car designer Carol Shelby, played by Matt Damon, and driver Ken Miles, played by Christian Bale, as they battle to build a Ford that can beat the dominant Ferrari at the 24-hour Le Mans race in France. Did this film diverge much from the typical Formula One biopic released this time in the late in the year, or what are your feelings? And that was the best car-related intro question I could come up with. <laughs> that was it. That was your <laughs> so intro. Okay. That was it. Great. Um, so your question was, did it rise above the standard kind of biopic formula? Formula. Biopic. formula. I see what you did there. there you go. Okay, got it. <laughs> Took me a few minutes. Sure. Um, so here's the interesting thing with Ford versus Ferrari. Um, I don't think it really rose up above standard sports biopic movies. Okay. My hopes are that it would going into it. I guess I expected something a little less conventional, a little less um, crowd cheering or crowd pleasing. Mm -hmm. I expected something a little less formulaic. 
I guess going back to your pun, I still enjoyed the film. I'll just go ahead and say I had a good time with it. Mm-hmm. But I'm surprised with how typical it was, given it being a different setting, you know, the racetrack, the Formula One the racing, a little different time period. And we're in the 1960s, you know, instead of modern day. And the fact that we've got Christian Bell and Matt Damon in it, which is really what surprised me, is I guess I thought the two of them signing on to this project, it was going to it was going to go a little step above maybe a typical rah rah cheer on the team sports biopic. And at the end of the day it didn't. It was still a crowd pleasing rah rah sports biopic. So again, not to say that I didn't enjoy it cuz I did have a good time with it. Uh I thought it was fine. I thought it was fun. I thought it was serviceable. I thought it told a story I did not know. And I thought the performances were fine. I mean, you know, nothing to write home about, nothing I'm going to pencil in any of my nominations for any award winning stuff, but I thought they were all really good. I'm just surprised because Christian Bale, (laughs) this is probably the first role I can remember Christian Bale playing where he is a crowd pleasing character that people like, like people, moviegoers like that is not a typical Christian Bale performance. He normally is playing a much more, uh, you know, you can't really love the character. He's always got some like darker side or some, uh, some other emotions to deal with here. He's just, yeah, he's a flamboyant kind of big, big, big mouth guy, but people in the crowd where I was watching it, you could tell they were waiting for him to come back on screen to see what he was going to say, what he was going to do. He's the fun one. We want to see what happens to him. And I, that's a very unique thing for Christian Bell to play such a conventional sports biopic character archetype like he does in this film so that being said i liked it um i didn't love it i wish i wish it shot for more but i'm curious chris your thoughts on it where do you stand on it with it being a sports biopic and kind of how it how it fares with with others well yeah i thought it was pretty typical um but i you know we talk about expectations i wasn't really expecting much going into it um so i got about what i thought i would out of it um interesting the thing that to me that kept the movie moving and I thought was the interesting highlight of it was Bale's performance. Hmm. Um, I, in a way, like, I mean, you know, he's always been a lot of the center of the focus, like in the Batman films, he's the main center. And I actually, it was weird because to me, he was playing this cantankerous, but talented genius in Ken miles because you know, he throws wrenches at people. Hmm. He's known to be kind of hard to get along with. I'm like, huh? That's interesting. That's kind of like supposedly Christian Bale is himself. Mm -hmm. Um, But yet he's talented Mm -hmm. and he has this charisma that still kind of wins people over. So it was weird in a way I kind of viewed it as Ken Miles was a (laughs) kind of like a stand in for Christian Bale, the actor. And it could be a little bit. I I think the difference here with with Bale's performance and the character he's playing is that um, he's he's still lovable. And still people still like people watching the film Mm -hmm. want somebody to hang on to. And you've got basically two guys here that both of them are playing hero roles. Mm, You like both of them. You want them to succeed. And I just can't remember too many Christian Bell roles where you're just like, oh, man, I hope I hope he makes it other than maybe a Batman. You know, (laughs) it's just there's always something you're kind of not as connected with his character because he's playing him that way. He's playing him as somebody that's a little more dangerous, a little tougher to love. This is a truly lovable guy. I mean, yeah, he's throwing stuff. He's having temper tantrums, but you, they show enough scenes with his wife and his kid and how he is. And it's oh, just kid. Well, yeah, we'll get to the kid. Oh yeah, um, we will. But you know, there again, it's just, he's, he's playing such a typical underdog sports role character. And I think what, you know, I don't. I didn't necessarily love his character, like you're saying. A lot, maybe you did, and a lot of people in the audience did. Yeah, the but audience I under, did. I understand. I did love when he was on screen because yeah. the movie kind of, you know, shifted back down into use another ah, car analogy. Man, like you're full second on gear or Good. first gear when yeah, he yeah. wasn't on screen. Yeah. But when he was on screen, that's when the movie was like humming along, Top Gear, doing great. And I will say too, this movie clocks in at over 152 minutes. Didn't really bother me. There yeah. were enough well-shot, paced race scenes, which is what people going to this film probably expect to see. I do think the race scenes were really well yeah, done. I thought they were delivered. They were well-shot. I followed them. I knew what was going on. Sure. It didn't. I didn't see an over-reliance on CGI. I mean, I'm sure there was, sure. but I didn't see it. Um, no, it was shot really well. 
here's the thing with me, Chris. You know, tell me if I'm wrong on this. I mean, it, it, it's and I guess this is why I'm still surprised that this film turned out this way. You know, you look at some crowd pleasing sports films, and I'm going to use "Remember the Titans" because we actually mentioned it. I think in the holiday spectacular we did with the Entrepreneur Exchange show recently. Okay. I love that movie, although it is the way it's shot. The story is told very cliche, very, very conventional, very much designed to pull at your heartstrings. I get it. I know that when I'm watching it. This is like the racing equivalent of Remember the Titans. Okay. (laughs) It's the villains are so over the top villainous. Yeah. yeah. The kids are over the top, adorable, cute. It's kind of cartoonish in that yes. way. Whereas I don't feel like maybe Remember the Titans was necessarily cartoonish, but I feel like the villains, well, the Ferrari in this film oh, is definitely well, like even Emperor take, Palpatine. Even I mean, take, it's ridiculous. Uh, even take, uh, he was played by uh, Josh Lucas, Leo BB. Oh, yeah, and he Ford. was terrible. It's too. the minute you see him on screen, you're like, oh yeah, he's a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> the way his hair is, yeah, and he has this like, like smirk. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's so telegraphed. Yeah, it is. Even remember the Titans, you know, every time they played an opposing team, the coach was either racist or said some bad <laughs> things or very aggressive. And it's like, it was all very cartoonish. And I, I this you. movie was more cartoonish in that regard than I expected or wanted it to be. But I will say the details of things they got right. Uh, you know, I did read up on these stories afterwards because I was really curious about did this okay. really, does this race really go down this way? And hmm. did it really end this way? And is this what really happened to these characters? And yeah, it's all pretty, pretty spot on. And I even had my, my local mechanic, my 18 year old son who going into motorsports engineering, that's his whole deal. He went and saw the film and he, he told me afterwards, he's like, it, it was pretty, I mean, all the technical, mechanical stuff was pretty spot on, too. So I'll give him credit for that. It seemed to be a very authentic film as far as storytelling. I'm sure there were a lot of uh, over uh, dramatic elements thrown in to, and to ease, uh, to make it go down easier for along the way. But um, it, was, it was a good movie. I thought it was good. I just I wish it could have been more. I wish it would have been a little more interesting. I wish it would have been a little more unique. It wasn't. But for what it was, I mean, it went down just fine. Uh, I I thought they tried to broaden it out other than just like, oh, let's be Ferrari. You know, they Mm -hmm. tried to broaden it a little bit about using creativity and how they were lightening the car. And so some of those things were interesting, could have developed that a little more. And also the idea of battling corporate influence because, Mm -hmm. you know, they were trying to make a car for Ford, but they had to, you know, the suits wanted it one way and they had to kind of, so using creativity, but also battling corporate. Those were two threads that were kind of in there that could have, like you're saying, could have done more with, could have done more with. I mean, there are interesting things to cover and the film wanted to at least mention, yeah, yeah, they're there. (laughs) Yes, these are things, but we're going to focus just on the fun racing and all that. So um, I will say real misgivings of the film. Oh, I've I've got two. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I've got two, and they're kind of related. Okay. One you've already mentioned is, I think, the kid, um, Miles' child, mm-hmm. um, it, which is a shame because it's Noah Jupe, who I know is in Honey Boy playing the young version of, right. of Shia LaBeouf, and he's a kid that's, I think, kind of on a hot streak right now with some new films. He was in A uh, Quiet Place. He was way too precocious, way too cute, right? way too on the nose. But I think that's just script. I don't think it's him. No, I, I, you're right. I think it is script, but man, it and was just a little maybe. much, a little yeah. much. And then my other second uh, misgiving was really the ending, the oh. very end scene. Yes. Way too. Terrible. It's terrible. Way too over the top. It's terrible. Um, and it didn't earn it. Yeah. So here's my thing, and I'm not spoiling anything with this, but we follow two main characters throughout the film. I get that those two are colleagues mm-hmm. and dependent on each other for mm-hmm. a race. I never got the sense that they were as tight as we're led to believe they should be by the end of the film. Right. So I felt really unearned, and it was really a cheap, let's, let's, let's make sure we're getting everybody all – sentimental and emotional in the last five minutes of the film. And it was just and plus it involved the kid too, which again, that whole sequence was just, uh, it was, yeah. it was, it, they should have ended it right before that scene. And See, I would have been fine with that. Yeah. I'll, I'll kind of expound upon it while trying to keep, you know, mm-hmm. this is in the history books so people can find <laughs> yeah, out stuff. But sure. yeah, the, the thread of hero worship yeah. of miles by his son. I mean, I get it. You know, he is this big figure. The son, you know, really admires his dad, but they just milked it for all it was worth. And that was kind of a red flag early on in the film. I was like, yeah. uh-oh, is this going to be a big theme? And it was. It overshadowed the creativity thing and the corporate in- interference thing. You know, um, 
But then it kind of disappeared for a little bit. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then it really like, with the closing of the film, the last bit really milked it and it was heavy handed. And, you know, I felt the film lost a little bit of its, you know, the magic that it had achieved with me and thinking, okay, you know, it's, it's a good closure. I wish, really wish it could have ended with the, how the race of Le Mans, the yeah. fight when they got there, because yeah. kind of the surprise of things that happened in the events and how actually Christian Bale's character, Miles has to kind of mature a little bit mm-hmm. or kind of, and that would, and then they kind of walk off together on the track and they're kind of having this little conversation. Amazing. Yeah. And then go to black and do the text over it. Like you always let do. us know what happened did. after the story, Yeah, which so, they yeah. still did in this film. Yeah. Tacking that last piece on, I thought was tacky. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, that was a, a kind of a groaner for me. And again, just, it didn't help the, the acting between Damon, the kid and all just, it was really, yeah. it just felt so forced and felt so almost like it was added on just yeah. to try to give some more emotional punch to Heart the film, punch. which it didn't need it. Well, so. you, you talked a little bit about how you were surprised Matt Damon and you were going in expecting kind of like, you know, both Bale and Damon to give really strong, super strong performances and kind of, you know, work off each other. And they did to a degree, but I was also surprised at how Matt Damon just kind of like seemed not sleepwalking. He's still a great actor, but just didn't really have a lot to well, do. Well, his role, but his, per, his character is supposed to be a little more of that kind of always even keel, you know, uh, just always, uh, I don't know. I think he played the part. Okay. I think he did fine. I thought both of them were fine. It's just there again. I, I guess I was just surprised at how conventional this was given two a list talents. Um, sure. Especially Christian Bell, who tends to be a little more particular about his projects. I just thought this was a really interesting choice he made to play a very typical biopic character. One that is going to connect with audiences and people want to see what he says. Funny, what little humorous things he does, what little tantrums he has. And that's just, I've never seen, I've never seen him play a role where he's kind of pandering to the audience, which I felt like this was. So there was an odd moment in the film that I'll go ahead. It doesn't ruin anything. I'll go ahead and talk about it. And it really kind of, shifted what I was thinking about Matt Damon's character, um, Carol Sh- or Shelby. Is it Carol Shelby or Shelby yeah, Carol? Carol Shelby. There we go. <laughs> um, he tosses, like during, there's Ferraris having, you know, they're pitting their car and they're working on it. He takes a nut into Ferrari's pit area and just mm-hmm. kind of tosses it down. To which the crew then, you know, the car then takes off and then they notice this nut sitting there and they're kind of like, oh, and, you know, Shelby just kind of laughs and like, and he had already stolen walkie talkies from their booth thing. And I was like, huh, yeah. that's odd because it was like, am I supposed to think that's funny or am I supposed to be like, wow, are you going to win this race because you're cheating? Yeah. You're making that team think that their guy's going to die because they didn't put a nut back on. That actually really bothered me. Well, I, I think I didn't like any sense of the idea of sabotage. And I yeah. mean, it was played for jokes. Walkie it was played for the audience. Thing. You know, it was played for jokes. But it was played for you know, the audience to say, oh, look, isn't this great? Don't you hate those Ferrari guys? Well, now we're going to stick it to them. But yeah, the whole nut thing is like, well, okay, that's pretty serious. Yeah. Like <laughs> they're freaking out thinking their driver's car is going to fall apart on the middle of the track going, so you, you know, 120 miles an hour. So yeah, it was kind of cheating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was. So. Yeah, a little odd choices again. It, that was kind of more of the, again, I felt like pandering to the audience. Sure. Let's do the typical things we do in a sports uh, movie like this where we want to get people all riled up and excited. We got to paint the villains in the worst light possible. Let's make sure our team members are all, we love all the team members because we want them to win. Sure. And then let's give them an ending that you may be a little double-edged sword ending that, you know. Anyway, it was very conventional, much more conventional than I expected. So... That is Ford versus Ferrari, or I guess Ford v. Ferrari. I mean, if we want to be technical about it, right? <laughs> sure. Latest from James Mangold, starring Matt Damon and Christian Bell. Chris and I are both saying it's fine. It was an you know, enjoyable movie, but nothing nothing unique, nothing really interesting beyond the typical sports biopic formula that, that you're used to by this point. But, you know, hey, it's on. I'd probably watch it again if it was on in, in a room where I was sitting Watch parts of it again. It's I'll a nice, them. safe holiday movie. It's very easy to go down. That's the way I said it. It's, I was there with my kid. My kid had a good time with it. I could watch it with a larger family, and everybody would have a good time with it. Doesn't do anything too too explicit, too racy. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good, overall, enjoyable film. 
All right. So the Ford V Ferrari. Chris, let's go ahead and move on to our second review, which is another film that's come out over the holidays here. This is the latest from Ryan Johnson, who brought us The Last Jedi, the latest Star Wars chapter. This is his next film from that uh, being involved in that saga. This is the murder whodunit, Knives Out. I'm Detective Lieutenant Elliot, and this is Trooper Wagner. We just want to ask a few questions. We understand the night of his demise, the family had gathered to celebrate your father's 85th birthday. How was it, by the way? The party? Pre my dad's death? Oh, it was great. When I heard writer-director Ryan Johnson's desire to make a modern-day Agatha Christie-style mystery, I was intrigued. Then the cast was released. Daniel Craig, Chris Evans, Jamie Lee Curtis, Michael Shannon, Don Johnson, Tony Collette, Lakeith Stanfield, Christopher Plummer. Okay, let me catch my breath. Johnson has a knack for taking familiar tropes, high school coming-of-age drama in Brick, heist film in The Brothers Bloom, and the space opera in, I don't know, some film in that space battle saga, yes. um, and putting his own spin on it. Did this movie deliver a unique take on the cinematic mystery, or did it leave you feeling like you had a knife not only out, but stuck in your back? <laughs> um, okay, so I came, up, I came up with my opinion on this film before reading any other reviews anywhere else. And okay. kind of, yeah, I really did. I really tried to avoid reviews and people's opinions it's on this. It's hard these days, Twitter, Letterboxd. I said, I'm going to go into this and really form a true pure opinion based on this. I like Ryan Johnson's films. Mm -hmm. Uh, I liked the last Jedi quite a bit. That's the name of that film. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I I know you didn't have it in your notes there, but I really liked the last Jedi. I know haters come on, bring it on, (laughs) but it's a really, really good star Wars movie. So I got excited when I saw knives out and I love murder mysteries. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock used to read his short murder uh, novels. He used to compile in books all the time. Of course, Alfred Hitchcock movies. I did watch the Agatha Christie movies and Hercule Poirot or whatever, Mm -hmm. uh, Murder on the uh, Orient Express and Death on the Nile. I loved all those old movies from the 70s and 80s. Just, I love that whole genre. So this was very exciting to me. And I loved the cast too. I thought the cast was great. So it's a shame to say I'm disappointed by the film. Um, I know exactly why I'm disappointed. I can spell out exactly the things that just didn't work. Can you spell it out without spoiling... Maybe. I think I can. I, I practiced. I think oh, I can okay. do it. I okay. think I can. Um, but let me go and hit the, the positives, the sure. things I think did work in this. But then I'm going to tell you the reasons why of the films we're going to review today. It's probably my least favorite of the three, which is kind of okay. interesting. Just not what I, I would have expected going in to this, uh, this round of films. Expectations. It is a little bit of that. Um, and I, I think I'll go ahead and say it's expectations, but it's also expectations that were implied in the film itself of it being a murder mystery. Okay. Right away, you set an expectation of what kind of film this is going to be. I'm all for subverting those expectations, but the way it was done here left me a little cold. Oh man. Okay. We disagree. All right. (laughs) So, um, I will say on the positives, um, I love the setting. I love the writing. I think the dialogue and the writing of this film, exquisite. Okay. I would love to read the dialogue from this movie as like a novel, as a book, because it's really well written. And it was original. It wasn't very taken written, from it, a which book. Which is it great. Was so good. Yeah, sure. Um, it's very well, well written. Brian Johnson is an outstanding writer. Mm-hmm. So I love what story he was telling. I like the performances, although I do feel like they were all very slight. And you could say that's to the service of the story. And I get that. That's fine. That's mm-hmm. fine. But you do have such a stellar cast. And I felt like just the nature of the film itself, each one was so hamstrung and limited in what they could do that they had to play a caricature for their five to seven minutes they got on screen. Right. And that was pretty much it. Right. I would have liked more. I think there's ways they could have done more. I'll get to that when I talk about my concerns. Um but I like the style and the the vibe of the film. I like the overall the 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 music. I like the cinematography. I like the you know the look, the set design, everything uh, visually, tonally, and words wise with the film. So yeah, that's uh, you know, again I like the film. Okay, right. but I'm just 
I'm not in love with it like so many other people I know are. And I'll get to my reasons why in a little bit. But Chris, tell me your thoughts. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this film. Yeah, I, I like this film. Um, I From the outset of the film, I was immediately having a good time. The staginess and the hyper real, I mean, you can't even call them hyper real, just the cartoonish that we've used that word, take a drink because we've already used that word in the first review. But but I felt like it was on purpose. The cartoonish nature of the personas just made me laugh. And it was like, you know, Tony Collette's character was just, you know, over the top. Jamie Lee Curtis's character over the top. You know, they were just all, Michael Shannon, all of them are just playing Chris, <laughs> Chris Evans over the top caricatures of people in this family. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed it. It actually reminded me in a good way of um, the 1985 film Clue. Oh, yeah. Which is kind of how I took it. You know, going in, I was like, okay, so obviously this one's going to be a little bit more serious than, you know, Clue really played up the comedy. But they also had a murder happen. Um, This one, I thought it was going to be playing up, having a little bit more comedy than it did, but it had just enough. But I was actually surprised at some themes that it was actually trying to pull through there. And actually, that kind of leads into, I was not disappointed and it didn't leave me cold, but it surprised the heck out of me. Um, the flow of the murder taking place and twisty revelations, but one that happened pretty early on, you're like, huh, okay. And, but then it, it was, I, w- I was fine with, I was fine mm-hmm. with the kind of the twisted habit. And I can see how you could feel like it was a cheat or you could feel like it didn't deliver the true mystery part. Um, I, I, I get that, but I guess it didn't, it didn't really. It didn't really. It didn't really bother me um, because I was taken enough with like the family dynamics, the corruption of wealth. There's an immigration theme that I was not mm-hmm. expecting to see in here, mm-hmm. um, and they were they were interesting. I mean, I expected family and wealth because you look at this, you can tell it's all family members. Mm-hmm. They're gathered in this house. The uh, patriarch, the father, dies, and he has all this money because he's a famous writer. So, you know, you kind of think, okay, it's going to be a lot about wealth and everybody fighting over that and a lot about infighting over family. And yes, it did have all those things. But the immigration aspect of another part of my favorite parts of the film, uh, Anna de Anna de Armas, who mm-hmm. plays Marta, the caregiver for Harlan, who's played by Christopher Plummer. I really thought she was amazing. I thought she was really yeah, she good. Was good. I thought she was really good. And just her screen presence, like her screen presence just before, just was awesome. Like, you know, she, I don't know. I just thought she was amazing. And I was thinking this has been the first thing she was in, but it's not. She mm. was in Blade Runner 2049. Yep. She's actually going to be in uh, no time to die James with Bond. Daniel Craig. Yeah. So you never saw knock, knock, did you with, knock, uh, knock. with, uh, uh, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> no, yeah. No, she I was in not. that. Okay. So she's been Quite around, a but role. I feel like this was like, you know, she had a pretty big with all these other major actors kind of playing a bunch of little supporting roles. Well, like you're talking about, it she was her was biggest a, role. She's a big central character. I mean, I think it's her biggest role. Yeah. I mean, she's she's the main character of this film. Right. So, right. So you mentioned about the <laughs> the kind of subverting and kind of throwing some interesting misdirection early on. Yeah. So, uh, and again, I will do this as non spoilery as possible. Um, okay. Yeah. The, the 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 Ryan Johnson decides to make a little twist in the story about a third of the way in, maybe even a quarter of the way in. Yeah. Pretty darn early. I would say, yeah, like a quarter, like 20, 30, 20 minutes in 30 minutes in. Sure. Not only about the murder finding out, you know what, but you basically find out a lot of the situation around it. Right. More so than you would expect to believe that you've just learned in a murder mystery. That's going to be two and a half hours long. (laughs) Right. Um, Or two hours long. And again, I'm fine with that. But here's my here's my issue is that I felt like the whole middle section of this film, like an hour or so in the middle, was a lot of spinning wheels because certain things have already been revealed. Certain revelations have already been shared. People are already in the know of something that's happened or what, what was the situation. So then the tone of the film changed from being a murder mystery to a how do we hide something? How do we cover up something? How do we get out of a situation? Which to me was not as interesting. It just was not as much fun. Now, granted, Ryan Johnson did something interesting late in the film by kind of turning it back into a murder mystery, which 
I will say the last bit is is pretty fun and juicy, but I felt like there's a whole swath where we just lost so much momentum because of a really interesting decision he made. And I'd credit him for that. I'm all for let's change it up, let's shake up the band, let's shake up the, the traditional. But I felt like it let out so much air out of the film for the whole middle swath that by the time we got to the end and it kind of ramped back up into murder mystery ter- territory, I kind of lost interest a little bit. I wasn't mm-hmm. as curious about where it was going anymore. And the film commits a, a crime for me as someone who likes murder mysteries, something it commits a crime itself that, you know, maybe I'm more, more uh, attuned to because I like this genre so much. There's no way you as a, as an audience member can figure out exactly what happened without a piece of information that is not revealed until the very last oh, reveal. Oh, come on. No, no, that no. That happens all the time. No, Murder no, no. on the Orient not, Express with that came out in the theaters was terrible. Oh, in the theaters, yes. But I'm talking about the original novel, the every, the movies and all that. No, no. There's always clues. You can figure it out in a good murder mystery if you really were paying attention. With this film, there's no way. Because a certain piece of information that's critical to unraveling everything is only revealed to one or two people, and then they reveal it to the world at the very last of the film. That, to me, again, I'm saying, if we're talking about this being meant to be designed as a murder mystery, with the word mystery being in there, that being the key critical part, that is something that, you know, he made the conscious decision. It was a daring decision. I credit him for that. But it affected me personally because it made it not as enjoyable. Mm-hmm. A, kind of tell every everything what that happened up front. Then you change the tone of the film to something very different, for a good while. Then you wrap it back up to murder mystery, but it's a murder mystery that's only fun for the person who has this one piece of information. And yeah, I didn't feel I, like it was as fun for the audience. Yeah, so. I disagree. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> I don't, I don't, yeah. I, without going into spoilers, I can't really yeah. say how I feel like it was different, a different experience, but I will say like the whole withholding a piece of information. Yes. I watched, unfortunately, mm-hmm. way too many episodes of Murder She Wrote. Oh yeah, with See, my now, I don't consider Murder She okay. Wrote a high quality so, murder mystery I'm, thing. I'm talking about true. Okay, here's the thing: when I took so my I, family, I, you know, yeah. withholding information like, and the way it was done, and and actually, I can give some justifications on, yeah, but I can't without spoiling stuff. Uh, it, it, it just worked for me, yeah, and I, I appreciate it. But I was surprised, and I will give you this. Okay, so there's. Let's, let's just divide it into thirds. Maybe it is fourths, mm-hmm. but let's just say thirds. So first third, there's kind of like a reveal or something. You're mm-hmm. like, oh, oh okay, <laughs> mm-hmm. about the murder. That middle portion, if we're going to say, you know, thirds, that middle portion, I agree with you, is kind of spinning wheels and everything. Yep. But the then twist that kind of starts the third portion, and let's say that runs out to the end of the film, I was so, so, I was so surprised by that, and I that it made the middle section kind of like better in a way. Mm, yeah. And I, I've only seen this film once and I think I would, and I liked it, but I felt like some of the plot mechanics or some of the mechanics you're talking about were a bit wobbly, but the more I thought about it, the more I felt like it was justified. I, I think it'd work if I saw it a second time, yeah. but I, I, I don't know. It's hard to say without spoiling stuff. Well, I, I'll, I'll say this. And again, I, I try to, I try to be a, a, a true professional film critic. You know, when we sit here at this microphone, <laughs> We're getting but, paid to be professional. Yes. We're getting yes. all all this money we're getting, yes. which is just crazy. Right. Um, <laughs> that's a joke, by the way, for anybody listening. <laughs> um, I took my family to go see this. Okay. They had seen commercials. Mm-hmm. They're expecting a murder mystery. My wife even going in and say, okay, I want to make sure I'm like wide awake because I want to pay attention. I want to like find, I want to like figure it out. And I'm just like, okay, at the end of the movie, it's like, yeah, there's, there's no way. No way you could have done it. That's true. It, it's truly not. If you go in with an expectation, which the marketing, the film, everything all plays up as a murder mystery, you you may come away disappointed because it's not really positioned that way. And see, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't want to be able to figure out a film. Mm-hmm. And so I actually like the fact that, yes, yeah, something's revealed that you, there's no way you would know that, but that's fine because if there's one thing I really dislike, it's when I figure out a film halfway through its running time or sure. th- and then I'm like uh, and then you, you still like it but you're like but see, yeah I really wish I hadn't figured out how it was but I think Ryan there's Johnson, no way yeah. you could figure that but out but I think so, that's oh. actually one thing that's really genius to the way Ryan Johnson positioned this film is that even if you think you've already figured it out early on he's done enough changing 
right. along the way to make you think, oh, maybe I have it. And then you get to the end and maybe you had figured it out. But you spent a good part of the film thinking you hadn't figured it out. So then you still enjoy it. Um, anyway. It, so it's, I, I like that. I'm glad he did that. It is ingenious. <laughs> okay. All right. I, again, I liked it. I thought it was fun. Uh, I just was hoping for a little more. Uh, I wish it had been a little more solid all the way through. I mean, you know, and we've got some actors playing some great parts. You know, Michael Shannon, you know, Don Johnson, Tony Collette. Yeah, all of them putting on great performances, but very, very small bits. And no, I, I'm not going to say because it'd be spoilery, but uh, not as impactful as I would have liked to have had in the overall film or story in general. So, yeah. But, you know, Knives Out, I'm, I'm, I'm saying positive. I liked it. Just... Would have loved a little more. So I'm going to briefly drop into spoiler territory. Okay. Just one more quick That's thing. Fine. If you don't want to hear it, if you haven't seen Knives Out, I think Alan and I are both saying it's interesting. We're yeah. checking out. I'm a little bit higher on it than Alan is. Sure. But what you can do is after we do this, we're going to go into a break and then we're going to come back to the, our next review. So if you don't want the spoiler, just fast forward till you hear the break or you hear us talking about A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Yes, the Mr. Rogers. But when you hear the Mr. Rogers trailer, right. you know you're, you're good. You know you're far enough. Yep. So, okay, you've been warned. We've given you time to skip. Three, two, one. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I totally didn't. You were made to hate Chris Evans, and I thought that was fun. I thought he was a fun character. And I actually thought when they had this scene in the diner, he totally kept me confused because I thought like, he's like, great, I'm going to screw my family out of money. Like I totally bought all that and was completely in the dark. And then the final reveal where it's like the medicine revealed, but here's my thing. And I'm great. Mm. I'm just justifying. Cause I like the film obviously better than you did. I mean, it didn't bother me, but I, I see why it bothers you. It makes more sense that she's such this attentive caregiver and she makes this lethal mistake because he made like she even knows the weight of the vials oh, yeah. and everything. Yeah. I thought and that it was all great. Makes sense how she could actually do it and then be like, "Oh crap!" Because he had messed everything no, up. No, I I love so the I, writing I of that. I, yeah, I love the idea that he. So you know, Chris Evans' character switches the the labels on the medicine bottles, thinking that it's going to trick her into administering the wrong medication dose to the old man. Who um, turns out she didn't because correct. She, yeah. What was the deal? She she administered the she wrong bottle. She had switched the bottles. It, she looked at the like, label after she administered it because she just doing it by instinct. Right. Realized, oh my gosh, I administered the wrong one. Well, she hadn't because Chris Evans' character had switched them already. Right. So really, she didn't kill him. Right. He killed himself because he was doing it to protect her and right. all that. Right. All that. I love that. That is genius. I love the writing behind that. My whole issue is... She accidentally is, saved his life when Chris Evans would yeah. have killed him. <laughs> the only issue for me is that the only thing at the time we realize all of that, the only time that makes it impact is when the toxicology report, which has been dangled around for like half the movie, that it's out there, somebody's got it, somebody's teasing you with it, and you don't get to see it. Nobody gets to see it. No, except for our Mr. Detective right on the last frame, which is him saying, oh, Look, I saw the toxicology. This explains everything now. And it's I like, gotcha. oh, you know. I, now, granted, looking back, there were a couple little minor clues left where you could have started to figure out that maybe Chris Evans' character was the one who did something. The fact that the grandmother, the old grandmother, right. called the uh, Marta his name. She's like, oh, you're and back And you're like, again? oh, you think it was just because you saw me outside and, and you're confused. No, it's because she saw him Ransom earlier, Ransom, yeah. and thought it was him again because he had been there before she was. So little what, things think, like that. I you think start on to look a back, second viewing, like, yeah. it would be a little bit more satisfying. But let me, let me throw yeah. this out there. And this is, I mean, it's not, st- so that, that was the one spoiler thing had. Yeah. Here's something that threw me off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what made me think it. But I think because I did, wasn't expecting the mystery to be solved, because basically you see that um, Marta is responsible not for killing him, but for the murder. And you see how I mean, like he basically committed suicide. But you you think he did it to try to save her. Here's something screwed up that I thought was actually, and I thought this was going to be the twist that Ryan Johnson was doing. Which there's a scene at the very end of the movie that actually surprised me that this wasn't the twist. Wonder if it was saved in or changed in editing. I thought he had switched the bottles on. I thought Christopher Plummer's character, Harlan, had switched the bottles on purpose. He was going to fake kill himself because he says something about, oh, these knives, or they're prop knives or mm-hmm. something like that, and says something about it, yet he uses a knife to slit his throat and to kill himself, mm-hmm. or at least you think. 
Yeah. So I think he, I thought he was like faking his death or something. That way the whole family squabbles would happen at the end of the movie. Again, this is spoiler territory, so I can say this. Yeah. Chris Evans, who's been revealed to be the big meanie, the guy who really did do everything bad, he pulls a knife from this like sculpture thing and comes at Marta. And what does it do? It is a prop knife and mm. it collapses. So then I was like, right. So then Christopher Plummer's not dead because that would have been a prop knife too. He didn't really slit his throat. And I was like, what? Like, so I was like, well, maybe that prop knife still had a sharp edge or maybe that was a different thing in the bedroom. Something I need to go back and watch the film a second time for. So that was one of the things I mentioned, like at the end of the day, I liked the film, but I was like, wait, something, something doesn't seem like it's Mm -hmm. adding up. Yeah. Um, But I still liked the film. I would recommend it. Um, Yeah. So it's, it'll be interesting. Hmm. So my reservations aren't quite, quite where yours were, but I, I had already like, butchered my expectations with this and i think that probably helped. yeah probably so i went in like looking forward to the whole family we were just kind of a good time with it it's gotcha. a whole throwback murder mystery and you know it had all elements of it but we all kind of came out of the theaters like yeah i mean it was fine it was fun not really the reaction i was hoping to get and i think it was because of that pacing True. breaking the film up and changing gears for that whole middle hour which you know, there's a car chase that really doesn't mean anything. There's like, but there's a joke made about that, isn't there? Yeah, there is. But again, it's like, okay, well, great. But yeah, we just spent ten minutes on a car chase, and it didn't mean anything. Which is kind of how I felt that whole middle hour is like, <laughs> it really didn't mean anything. Like, he just is going to come back at the end and spin another part of the tale, which is mm-hmm. fun and exciting. But then it really invalidates any of the reason why we had to watch the last hour of this film. So mm-hmm. anyway. It's a little bit of the balance overall of the film, I think, was the issue for me. So, uh, but again, I love how well written it was. I love the dialogue. Uh, I love the set. I love it. You know, I've already talked about it. We're out of spoilers now. So, <laughs> all right, that's Knives Out. Let's go move on to our, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a break then. Yeah. Let's take a break. When we come back, we've got one more review to do. That is A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, starring Tom Hanks as Mr. Fred Rogers. And then we will go on to our recommendations of the episode. Each of us will have a film we want to share and recommend that we think is worth checking out. So you're listening to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Moose from Street Circle Drive. That's the Hickory, North Carolina-centric podcast here on The Mesh. Be sure to check out our show and all the others at TheMesh.TV. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on the TheMesh.TV first half of the show we reviewed two films for you ford v ferrari and knives out we'll move on to our third review in just a moment but before we do just as a reminder you are listening to this podcast on the mesh.tv network that is a network of podcasts all free and able for you to download at any time you can find the different shows we have on the network at the mesh.tv that's t-h-e-m-e-s-h dot tv on your web browser and from there you can choose to download individual episodes and play them or you can even choose to subscribe to a show Um, by subscribing that means that every time a new episode comes out you have that episode downloaded to your podcast player of choice whether it be your phone your tablet your tv set your computer wherever it may be we're also featured uh, on itunes Uh, no well i guess it's not itunes anymore they call it the podcast app on both your iphones or your Macs, as well as the Google Play Store, Stitcher Radio, and several other providers. So please take a look and search and find us. Uh, Feel free to subscribe and make sure you don't miss a single episode of Candle Films as they come out. So Chris, let's go ahead and move into our third and final review for the show, which is the latest film talking about a Mr. Fred Rogers, this one from a narrative dramatic standpoint. We have a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Hello, neighbor. Hey, I'm looking for Fred Rogers. In here. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Please, won't you be my neighbor? Hello, neighbor. In 2018, a documentary about children's television star Fred Rogers called Won't You Be My Neighbor was released to high acclaim. We reviewed it here favorably on this podcast. Oscar time rolled around, and I thought for sure it was a lock as a contender. No dice. Didn't even make the final five for documentaries, actually. 
Director Mario Heller has now made her third film called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, starring Tom Hanks as Fred Rogers. Her previous film, Can You Ever Forgive Me?, garnered Melissa McCarthy an Oscar nomination for her portrayal of real-life writer Lee Israel. Do you think Hanks will get any attention for his portrayal of Rogers, and what was your experience overall with this film? Um, okay, so we'll, we'll, you know, Tom Hanks playing Mr. Rogers, which, mm-hmm. uh, first off, we should go ahead and note, I don't think it's a lead actor role. I think it's very much a supporting actor role. I agree with anyway. that. A very but, strong supporting actor role. It, okay. Oh, um, Alan says, not really. Uh, okay. okay. Interesting. Um, I'll say this. Uh, Tom Hanks has played a bevy of real life people before. I mean, I think there's probably at least five, six films I can rattle off where he has played a real person. Mm -hmm. Tom Hanks is never known. His best performances are ones where he doesn't have to try to do an impersonation. He's trying to just embody the idea of the person and who the person is. This is a performance where I do feel like I see a little bit of trying to do an impersonation and it didn't work as well for me. Hmm, Actually, I would say his performance was probably the least favorite thing about the film for me. Wow. That being said, I did love this film. It's just, I even loved it in spite of having some misgivings with how Hanks decided to do more of a impersonation of Fred Rogers than just be somebody who's Fred Rogers, which great. Hanks still gets the, the, the personality. He still gets the emotion side down, but I do feel like there's a little bit of i I've got to, talk this way. I've got to hit these notes. I've got to walk this way. It's a little more of an impersonation that I don't really think Tom Hanks does as well in. So Mm. I really love this film, but I will say that's probably the weakest element for me is, is his actual performance, believe it or not. Hmm. So I got a lot of other reasons why. So do you think he'll get a nomination? I don't think he will. Interesting. I really don't think he will. Okay. I, I think he's done so much more stronger stuff before this seems a little more of a of a of a gimme performance for him, just something where it's kind of handed to him here, here, just be this person and say these lines. His his role is a lot smaller in the film than a lot of people might think going into it. Mm-hmm. He really is the supporting actor. You know, really the lead character we're looking at is Lloyd Vogel, played by Matthew Reese. Um, he's the lead actor now. His performance, yeah, he's really good in this. I liked him a lot. Uh, and again, I'm not saying Tom Hanks is bad. I'm just saying no, he's so much you're better. You're bashing than... Tom Hanks, everyone. Hate mail. I'm bashing, Alan, I'm bashing Tom Campbell. Hanks playing Fred Rogers. No, he's just bashing Tom Hanks. He's the poster child for America, and Alan is bashing Tom Hanks. You heard he, it here. He, he does, he's fine in it. It's just I, I like so many other elements of this film so much better sure. that his performance wasn't really a big, big part of it for me. Um, I will say – I love the writing of this film. I think the script writing and just the format of the of the film, the first three, four minutes of the film, it got me. And right away, I'm hooked in because there's a conceit they use in setting up the Mr. Rogers Neighborhood show and how it interweaves with the story we're about to see. And as soon as they introduce that conceit, I'm like, yep, okay, I'm in. I'm, I'm in for this. I'm ready. And it kept that the whole way, and I thought it did a really great job with that. Um, it really gave it an interesting spin. It really showcased the importance of Fred Rogers' program, the impact it had. But it didn't skirt away from you know some heavier subject matter that the real story was going to be following as well. And how do you kind of bridge those two together? And I think the film did a beautiful job of doing that. Um, so I've got a lot of things I can mention, but I want to kick it over to you. What, what were your thoughts on the film overall? And do you disagree with me on Hank's performance? I mean, you know, it, it sounds like pretty much – we have the exact same experience with this film, except mm-hmm. um, I I thought Hanks was great. Okay. And um, I, similarly with me, you mentioned like, yeah, from the opening of the film, I was like, oh, oh okay. It kind <laughs> of took me a little bit back because one of my major problems going into this film, I think we talked about it on news. We mentioned that this film was being made and that Tom Hanks was going to be Mr. Rogers. Like, oh yeah, he could play a nice guy. You know, but my my kind of worry going into this was, yeah, but I've seen that documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Mm-hmm. And although a dramatic telling of it, I'm sure will be interesting about a biography about Tom Hanks, or about <laughs> Tom Hanks, a biography about Fred Rogers. I just, you know, okay, but I was just really, really hesitant. And like you mentioned right off the bat, 
you say, nope, that's not what this is going to be. Yes, he's in it. Mm-hmm. He, Fred Rogers, the, you know, he plays an important part in it. But it's it's not really a biopic. I mean, it mm. is, but it's not. And it's just really bizarre how they did that. And I was, I was like, oh wow, oh wow, <laughs> yeah. like you know, as it and just kind of the breaking the fourth wall element of mm-hmm. having that character be a set piece. Yeah, just it really threw me for a loop, and I was really surprised. So right away, I was on board. And then you know, as the movie kept going, I'm like, and it hits some notes of like forgiveness and some like mm-hmm. things that you could say were a little bit stereotypical with some of the baggage that that writer played by, um, Reese Matthew is, Reese, yeah. yeah. Lloyd played, Vogel. Yeah. Lloyd. So Lloyd has some, you know, struggles and then you could say, Oh, well the movie was very stereotypical with how it handled where Lloyd starts off at and where he ends at the end of the movie. I guess you could say that, but for me, the, it for me that wasn't the case because yeah. it was such a unique way that he was brought around to where he was at the end, kind of telling a helping it to be a non typical biopic because it wasn't about Mister Rogers but how he was able to help somebody in this case Lloyd Vogel who was based off a writer in real life um, Tom Junod who wrote mm-hmm. a piece about Esquire magazine so there were elements there that were true to that fictional created character um, but yeah that was just so so refreshing. And I, I see, I see Alan nodding. Um, oh, you yes. talked about one of the devices they used and we'll just, I'll just go ahead and say it was like aspect ratios mm-hmm. with, you know, there were typical scenes that are shot, you know, in 16 by nine, like, you know, movie ratio. But then sometimes they would use as cutaway scenes, model scenes that looked just like Mr. Rogers, like the little cars going around or like, you know, zoom shots through a little neighborhood and they would be in the TV ratio four by three. And immediately that that's, and you know, you see the black bars when they cut to that and you're like, Oh, Oh, like it, but it was, it was so refreshing. And they, they kept that going the entire movie. There's actually one that's towards the end of the film. That's, you know, it's this Mm -hmm. cars go into a certain place and you're like, Oh, and it's something you probably wouldn't normally see in a Mr. Rogers episode, even though he handled very serious topics, but you're like, Oh, interesting. That was was great. (laughs) They they kept that idea going. So yeah, I was, I was big on that. No, absolutely. I, I again, I loved everything about this movie. You know, but people want to talk about Tom Hanks's performance, and I thought it was the least interesting part of the film for me. It was his acting performance. Uh, it was, you know, we well, we talk yeah. about the documentary a little bit, sure. And to me, this is a good companion piece to it, absolutely. Where the documentary is a true biography. Let's talk about him as a person. Let's sure. talk about the people who knew him. Let's talk about what he was like. This film is the impact. He had right. on people instead of just you see people that from saying, that "Oh, he was right. so great." This is like, okay, you get to see the yeah. impact, yeah. Because again, yes, uh, the 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 development that Lloyd Vogel goes through during the film, it's it's a tough development. It's not something he goes easy into, and it's. But the moments he's sitting down or listening to Fred Rogers or having a great conversation or seeing the impact Fred Rogers has on other people you can tell is affecting him. You can see it. I mean, you see him growing as a person Mm -hmm. development wise over the course of the film. And then it does kind of culminate to some degree with some, a bit of a reunion situation late in the film. That's very well done. It seemed very natural. It seemed like, okay, these are, this is a family where there are some fractures and issues, but these are people who are willing to try to work through them in uh, in light of a potential tragedy. And I think something too, that, you know, I talked about how somebody could knock the film for Lloyd's, you know, change of heart progression, you know, in the film. And I think that's one thing like you kind of mentioned there, his progression, he does start one place, ends another place, but it is so gradual, but you can see it happening, Mm -hmm. but it is gradual. So it's not like a lot of films, maybe the first two thirds, he's a big crank pot. And then the last third, he's like, Mm -hmm. Oh, everything's wonderful. And he's skipping around. Like, no, this was a very slow, but steady build, but you could see the, the changes taking place. All right. Completely agree. Um, I want to call out a couple of other performances. I mean, I I already mentioned Matthew Reese, kind of in the lead role, Lloyd Vogel. Uh, I've really liked him on, you know, the Americans was a TV show. He was on for several years. He's actually going to be playing the new Perry, um, not uh, Perry Mason on HBO doing like a throwback 1930s huh. kind of uh, investigator series. Yeah. So he's going to be <laughs> okay. the new Perry Mason on HBO. 
He's a really great actor, and he's Which maybe really you'll good. like that solving mysteries better than you did Knives Out. Maybe that'll uh, maybe maybe, avoid. maybe they gotta <laughs> just make sure you treat it like a true mystery. Okay. And give me all the facts. Give me all the evidence. Um, Matthew Reese, I, I thought really good. Chris Cooper playing his father Jerry Vogel, very good. <laughs> so. And you know we I've seen Chris Cooper sing before in yeah. the Muppet, <laughs> one of the Muppet films, the recent Muppet yeah. films. But seeing him and that song, and at first. And, you know, here's an example you were talking about with the writing of this film. Mm-hmm. So at first, it's at a wedding, and he hasn't seen Lloyd's character in a while, and he sings this song. And at first, you're like, oh, gosh. And, you know, you've kind of been warned, okay, this is the father yeah. and his kind of where he's at in life. And it starts, you're like, okay, this is just a typical train wreck. Okay, whatever. But then, actually, you see in the song, as much as he can be at that moment, it is heartfelt. Mm-hmm. And the words of that song, and it's like, wow. And that that writing right there is like, okay, you know, there again, it's just kind of a, a standout moment for Cooper. But then also for the film, it's like, no, we're not just going to hit a typical note here. This is, there's some levels going on here. Absolutely. And that was well, really speaking nice of levels see. and kind of things not expected too, there's a dream sequence, maybe halfway, two thirds of the way through the film. Mm-hmm. That's pretty, I mean, it's not something I would have expected going into this film at all. Yeah. There was a uh, very, uh, just, it was a very unique styling to it. It, it. it kind of just kind of came out of nowhere. But then once you realize what was going on, you kind of wanted to follow along with it. It was, uh, it was really well done. A very, very odd little piece of film in the middle of this. But it's just enough to give this some some real vibrancy and something with some life to it. Because I was really nervous going into this, thinking it was just going to be a, oh, let's just watch Fred Rogers become friends with this guy, and he's going to make this guy better. And that's it. And it was so much stronger and more unique and better than that. So I really... I admit any of this, but you know, I, I can't remember a movie where I think I might have been... A little on the messy side, the wait entire a, hour. Wait a second. An hour, wait uh, the a second. entire hour, 50 minutes. If we, you know, I remember when I watched the documentary, Yeah. Won't You Be My Neighbor, I said, I watched in the theater, and there were several times where I was like wiping rivers and waterfalls from my eyes because it was so like, yeah. I was so into it, and it, it really moved me. This film, I was as well, but I remember with the documentary, you were like, eh, yeah, whatever. The documentary, whatever. yeah, first, <laughs> uh, first, I remember the situation. First time I watched it was not, I don't know for whatever reason it was not a great screening for me. So um, I, I I didn't get as much out of it. I did watch it again on my own, in the comfort of my own home, kind of where I could be a little more vulnerable, emotional, and it worked a lot better. This one right away, first. I mean, honestly, in that first five minutes, once the picture board opens up and you realize the whole they're going to weave in the story into the show. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm 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 out. <laughs> I mean, I'm, no, I'm, I'm in. It's right. just. Emotionally, I'm already like really. Rated. Oh yeah, absolutely. Wow. It was okay. great. It's a very refreshing film. Um, a nice film about goodness and kindness and people doing the right thing, couched in some very real life situations that many people go through, and kind of how do you marry the two? How do you work alongside them? I thought it was interesting. It did touch on all those things, and also uh, how to deal with anger, mm-hmm. and that's something that you know I think we can always stand to hear a little bit about how. The genius Mr. Fred Rogers would say, you know, yep, anger's natural and it happens and you don't have to hide it, but, you know, dealing with it or trying to express it and get it out may help you work through it. And yes. I was like, okay, you know. Well, and even not to spoil anything with it, but the very last shot of the film, if you recall, mm-hmm. in the studio, um, uh, Mr. Rogers by himself, and I'm yeah. just going to kind of leave it at that. There's even a moment where, you know, some music's been playing, but then there's a, crescendo of things that you almost kind of get the idea that, you know, he himself has some anger he's letting out and that's his way of doing it. And it's like the documentary was great. The documentary Mm -hmm. gave us all the information about him and really listened to the people that knew him well. And we got to learn a lot more about him in his history and kind of where he, where, where, how he got to where he was. This film, I feel like is a great way of understanding the impact it had on people both growing up and even to know the impact he was having on adults, like at the same time, I'll call out one or two other moments. I thought were just great moments, just highlights of the film for me. I've definitely got a moment that I want to call out and I'm wondering, I would almost place bets that it's going to be one of the ones you're going to call out. Um, in a restaurant. Oh yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> so I thought when the moment started, I thought I was going to hate the moment. But as the moment went on, I loved it. And it's something that's echoed in the documentary about yes. the whole taking time to think about people in your life that yes. mean the most to you. Yes. And that plays out in the film. And where I thought it was maybe a little cliche when it started, the way they held it, the way they framed it. And how about the way it ended? The way it ended um, was great. So I'm um, yeah. very happy with that. Other one, there's a scene also in the film where the film doesn't go into a lot of detail about the making of the show. It's not interested in that as much. Although it does have some scenes that are kind of interesting. And there's, there's one. one that's kind of funny um, uh, with the tent being set up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was <laughs> – I mean, but that – by the end of that scene, you realize why it's there. It's like that's just showing his whole message of – I want people to know that this is hard. Adults yep. make mistakes. Adults can't do it sometimes, and it's okay. Yep. But him doing the puppeteering mm -hmm. in one of the scenes and Lloyd watching him be the puppeteer. Mm -hmm. And just that is one moment where Tom, Tom Hanks really did nail that part then. I mean, just that attention to what he's saying. And you could see kind of in Mr. Rogers' face kind of what he was trying to have the, the, the animal say. Right. And Lloyd Vogel watching him from kind of backstage, it was a really nice little moment, just a great way of framing that. So a couple of things I really admired in the film. But overall, I, I love the film. thought it was great. Uh, big surprise for me. I did not expect to enjoy it as much as I did. So I'll give a little uh, Easter egg for people who haven't seen this film yet, and I wonder if you picked up on it. Um, in that restaurant scene, which won't go much into it more than that, so it doesn't spoil it for people, but uh, one of the people in the restaurant is – of uh, the real life wife of Fred Rogers. It's a uh, Joanne, I yeah, believe, so, uh, Joanne Rogers. Yeah. yeah. So she's actually in the diner. She's one of the people sitting in the diner. And had I not watched the documentary in 2018, I probably, I, there's no way I would have realized that. Um, but because I'd watched that documentary when I saw, I was like, Oh wow, that's, that's her. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. cool. You know? So I, I thought that was it. So I guess you did recognize that that's who that was in that scene. I recognize that because I do remember the documentary, but I'll, I'll add one more element to it. I was going to read about it in that exact same scene. There may be other people. I there is one other, okay. the person who plays the, uh, who used to play the Mr. McFeely. Oh, is he there too? He's okay. in the restaurant also. Yeah. Okay. So I, I saw her and I recognized her and thought, okay, that was nice. And then I read up on it and like, oh, Mr. McFeely he, was there he too. He was there so too. Doesn't surprise that was, me. That was nice. Nice little touch. Yeah. So yeah, that is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Sounds like we're both really high on it. And even better, it was a surprise, which is something I was really happy about. So Well, and I'll say too, I'm going to bring up one other thing I loved about sure. the film. Um the soundtrack, uh, which I really liked. Mm. And it was actually, it's her brother, Nate Heller, who does the soundtrack mm. for the movie. He had okay. uh, a Nick Drake song, a Cat Stevens song. And I guess he helped pick the song that was sung by Chris Cooper. So, yeah, I, I had no idea that, A, she had a brother, the director had a brother, and that, mm. B, he does soundtracks for movies and that he did this one. Well, and so even the orchestral great. stuff is very... He used the same uh, instruments that the old sure. TV show did. So it had a very, very just pleasant feel to it. And uh, yeah, no, that was great too. I will say so that, you know, Alan did the one kind of nitpick with uh, Tom Hanks performance, mm -hmm. you know, slight, but you know, slight. The, so if I had to say something so that I'm not just all glowing about this film, I would say that initially I was a little let down, even though I liked how they had started the movie. I was a little let down that they created the fiction of Lloyd Vogel instead of going with the real life writer, Tom. Yeah, do you know? That was kind of an interesting choice. But then I'm guessing, you know, we learn a little bit about the real life writer in the documentary. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of learn, like, you know, his, so I think just to make for a better movie and to have it be, you know, emotional beats and to do something different and have it focus on him as opposed to Mr. Rogers, I think, you know, it was just a way to carry the movie in a unique way. So yeah, I think, I think that's why they did it. But initially it kind of bothered me. I was like, no, why, why isn't this the real dude? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. It's a real Mr. Rogers, but it, I, I could let go of that. Something else I will say that I think could be distracting. And it's just, you know, there again, slight nitpick. Um, at one point we see a montage of kind of things that had happened in the real Fred Rogers, life, like some footage of mm -hmm. a protest and for and it's never really touched on in A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. It's just like you see some stuff. Now, if you've seen the documentary, you realize, oh, this is people protesting for stands that he had said about gays or something. Mm. Or this is him after the Kennedy assassination. It was like 
they were kind of throwing in some things that I don't think would make necessarily sense unless you'd seen the documentary. And it, it was very slight, you know, it was like maybe 15 seconds as kind of a transition, mm-hmm. I think to a different part of the film. But I thought that was a little odd. I was like, Oh, they, they threw that in there. They didn't have to. And in a way it kind of doesn't make sense unless you know some of the things that, you know, I, I just thought that was, that was odd. No, but, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I, it didn't strike me as much, but you're right. I think it does. It was a little bit of an odd choice to, to feature that and not really kind of make any more mention or explanation of it. But that's why I think, you know, and I, I never want to recommend a film that should be watched with another film, but I do think this is a perfect combination. I mean, if you watch the two of these films together, they complement and feed each other so, so well. So I, I would agree. And yeah. that's such a, odd thing for me to say because that was my whole fear Mm -hmm. is that the documentary would ruin this narrative kind of make this narrative not essential just why why bother why bother making it i actually think it elevates it i think i think both elevate each other and complement it so yeah it's a rare case where recommend both (laughs) all right so you got a two for a recommendation there for us so so we are both uh, very high on a beautiful day in the neighborhood it uh, got some got some wide release for a while. Uh, don't think it did as well box office wise or not maybe around for too long. So if you don't get a chance to check it out in theaters, uh, we do recommend checking it out when it's available online here in the coming months as well. And we'll see if uh, we'll see if I personally think Matthew Reese, if anybody is going to get some nomination, I'd love to see that happen there. But, you know, Tom Hanks may just because he's Tom Hanks and he he and Meryl Streep kind of have the automatic bids a lot of times on these roles. So we'll see if they get some, some award love for their performances for either of them. All right. Uh, Chris, we have gone through three long reviews of films. Um, normally we'd like to squeeze them some news or trailer, a trailer talk. We just don't have time because we had a three big long reviews. So I'll tell you, let's just go ahead and jump right to our final segment of the show. This is our recommendations. These are films that we've caught back up with, or we are, recommending you check out if you have time uh, maybe they flew under the radar maybe they're brand new releases that went straight to online or maybe some older films that we haven't seen in a while so chris i would love to hear what your recommendation is for this episode okay well um i caught up with a film during this end of the year rush we you know alan and i start getting screeners that we're supposed to check out to hold for for our consideration for the end of the year lists and things that we're making and one that I know that there is no way I would have caught up with other than the fact I happened to get a link. I was like, oh, I think I've heard of this film. Let me check it out. It's uh, Diane by Kent Jones. And it's the story of a devoted friend and caretaker, uh, particularly to her drug-addicted son. But um, she goes around and just takes care, visits people in the hospital, delivers meals to people that are sometimes shut-ins. But and it's it's a very heavy film. I'll just get that out of the way right away. But it is very seems very true to life. And the person playing Diane is Mary Kay Place. And I think in a just world, she would get one of the five nominations for uh, Best Actress when the hmm. Oscars come around. But because this film is not as widely seen, mm-hmm. she probably won't. Mm-hmm. And Mary Kay Place, to me, that's not a household name. I don't re- but if you show me this one, I'll be like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I totally know who that is. And for her to have this big role is really cool because she's a longtime actress. You've seen her in bunches of stuff. And for her to have this major role was really cool for her to see and or for me to see. And she she knocks it out of the park. Awesome. So, uh, Diane, it's a film from earlier in this year, and uh, it's on it's on iTunes and other streaming services. So, so you can I, buy it, rent it now. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I recommend that. Diane. Yeah, it's not one, unfortunately, that's gotten a lot of uh, kind of on the list anywhere people are watching out for performance-wise. But I've heard a lot of circles of people saying that they were really impressed with her performance in the film in general. So, Chris, I'm in, I'm in such a holiday spirit mood. I'm in a giving mood. How about I give you one more recommendation? Would that be okay? Because well, here's the deal. I, I don't have one this episode. <laughs> actually, I think you do. I oh. think you would recommend Won't You Be My Neighbor? And uh, I will second that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fact, because we've talked about how we think it would be a good companion. Well, that's a good point. If and you get to see A Beautiful Day. It's been a little while since we reviewed it. We reviewed yeah. it when it came out. But yeah, I, I will absolutely say, and, and just like you alluded to earlier in the conversation, I was maybe not as warm to it the first time around. Maybe I was just, 
I, I know exactly kind of the parts that kind of rubbed me the wrong way the first time I saw it or just didn't work for me. Sure. Is when I felt like the, the documentary was maybe a little bit more of a um, let's just really praise the, 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 the person who was Fred Rogers. You had some interviews from people who were working for his foundation. And, of course, their, their desire is going to be to make sure you know just how good he was and all, which I'm great, grateful for. But I also wanted the documentary on um, first glance to be a little more really let me help help me understand him truly, not what the marketing team wants me to see, but what, you know, or the foundation. Second time through, I was able to kind of let go of some of that cynic, cynic, cynicism and really look at it for what the film was. And it's a, it's a really wonderful documentary. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree with you. I think that's a great recommendation there for um, I tell you what, I can't think of a better way over the holidays, family together, Absolutely. two great films to watch. I mean, if you have a chance to go out and see A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, but then also you got the documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor? You can watch at home anytime. It's a great double feature, great, great, uh, great pairing of films there about a great subject. Great. Wonderful. Okay, good. Well, thank you for sharing that recommendation <laughs> with me. So no I came in empty handed. And you provided, and I appreciate it's the that. the season of giving. It is. So that wraps us up for uh, this episode of Foot Candle Films. Uh, we had our three reviews of Ford v. Ferrari, Knives Out, and then A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Uh, and then we also gave our recommendations, which was Won't You Be My Neighbor, the documentary. And then also Chris gave a recommendation of Diane uh, that you can find both of those online available to rent or purchase. So with that, Chris, I think we're about ready to wrap up things on the, uh, as, uh, but we do need to talk about a little bit, I guess, as people want to reach out to us, they want to follow up with us, they want to chime in with their own opinions and ideas about the films we discussed or anything else, or even suggestions for other films we need to be discussing. Uh, what should they do at that point, Chris? You can reach out to us through the email, which is you know very common these days. You can do that at info. Electronic mail is what they refer <laughs> yes, to it as. Yes, electronic mail. Yes. Info at themesh.tv and just mention Foot Candle Films in the subject line and it'll get filtered our way. Um, I would also ask that you keep in mind if you're a filmmaker or a script writer that uh, our Foot Candle Film Festival is coming up September 23rd through the 27th, and we are now submitting, or sorry, we are accepting uh, submissions through Film Freeway. So if you have a film or have a script that you would like for us to see and possibly accept, uh, please do so. We're looking for good stuff. Absolutely. We have a lot of good stuff has already come in, but we're, submissions are actually open until June, so you do have some time. Mm-hmm. But uh, the earlier you enter, the cheaper the submission fees. So there's that. Absolutely. We're looking forward to a great festival again next year, uh, next September, the last week in September of 2020. Should be a lot of fun. It'll be our sixth annual Foot Candle Film Festival. All right. Well, Chris, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I know uh, I think there's still another episode coming out here at the end of the month before the end of the year. Guess we'll need to be talking kind of best of the year as we get into our first of January. Yes. Kind of looking backwards at the year. We always try to highlight maybe our five or so favorite films of the year and then maybe bringing out kind of a what might have been a big disappointment or, or something that was a little more we don't like to call out bad films we're not no. here to say you know what was the worst film of the year it's more of a what was a film that didn't just didn't work for us the way we hoped and maybe it was a disappointment or a letdown whether or not it was a really great film or not um so we'll try to squeeze that into our schedule sometime in january and try to record an episode of that first half of january or so but otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of the, the, the year and the next episode we've got coming out. And we'll look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks so much for listening. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.